Good morning and welcome. It is so odd to be here on Easter Sunday when it's really um, doesn't feel like it at all. And uh, so we're excited to ultimately celebrate Easter when we can all be back together. And uh, still, 
We want to celebrate the day that we s celebrate the, the risen Christ and uh, what that means for us today. And uh, so here we are celebrating in a very socially distanced uh, manner. Um, I had to get out my measuring tape and make sure that, uh, you know, we had enough space so as to not infect one another. Um, but we do want to infect one another with the love of Jesus, and that's why we're here doing what we do, um, because the Lord has risen, and we are uh, empowered by who He is and His love for us. So with that, stand with us. Um, no. Yes. If you're in your living rooms, you can do whatever the heck you want, but if you're still in your pajamas, praise the Lord. And uh, if you're not and you're dressed and ready to go in your Sunday best, also wonderful. So, um, Father, we thank you for the celebration of this day when you, um, you came to the earth and you lived among us and you walked in a way, Father, and you called us to follow after you. Father, I pray that you would make our feet quick to follow in your footsteps. And, uh, Father, help us understand. Uh, for me, I know that one of the great conundrums in uh, the way you chose to do things was the way of the cross. It oftentimes baffles me, Father. I don't know why, um, when you could have set things up anyway, that you chose that way still is a mystery. But, Lord, I just pray that uh, we would understand your love more deeply um, and that we would walk, Father, with strength and integrity that comes from you. And, uh, yes, Father, thank you. And we just look forward, Father, to the time in the near future when we can celebrate together and ultimately, Father, at the end of time when all of your creation will celebrate. And we just uh, look forward to that with hope. And we just uh, pray, Father, that that hope would sustain us in times of difficulty and, and just uh, put a fire in us, Father, to live fully, Father, with laughter and with joy and with, um, uh, with just an intentionality, Father, recognizing that every moment of every day is precious. Mm -hmm. And we pray, Father, this in your name. Amen. And now 
this love of Christ shall flow like rivers. So come and wash your guilt away. The 
one who wore our sin and shame, now robed in majesty, the radiance of perfect love, now shines for all to see. Your name, your name is victory. All praise will rise to Christ our King. Your name, your name is victory. All praise will rise to Christ our King. that held us now gives way to him who is our peace his final breath upon the cross is now alive in me your name your name Let 
to him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing. Father, thank you again, and we just pray, Father, for your love to um, fill our hearts, Father. May we understand the height and the depth, the width and the breadth of your love for us, Father. And may we extend that love, Father. May it just move us, Father. The, the knee-jerk reaction to your love is to love. And we just pray that that would be true for us. And, uh, Father, we just thank you for this time this time that we have to uh, become closer, Father, with uh, those that are in our immediate circles, Father, whether that be our daughters or our sons, our wives or our husbands, our friends, Father, whoever they may be, Father, that we would recognize how important your love is when it comes to um, relating to and understanding the people that you've put into our world. 
And Father, we just pray that your hope would fill us and would sustain us. Until that day, Father, when we meet face to face, we pray this in your name. Amen. So we're reading from 2 Corinthians 3, verse 12 through 18. Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses, who put a veil over his face to, refer, to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. But their main minds were made dull, for, this, for to this day the same veil remains when the Old Covenant is read. It has not been removed, because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is, spirit, is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we, and we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, we are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that the veil is taken away, that we can see reality for what it is, what is really going on in the world and in our lives and in the process that you are go having us go through. We just pray that that process continues and that you would, your spirit would keep working in our lives and in the lives of our nation and in the lives of the world. We just leave that to you and your spirit. We just pray that you know that all the needs that uh, we are experiencing and that you would take care of those needs as we move through this difficult time. These things we pray, amen. Thank you, Tim, one of our elders. Appreciate you coming out and reading. He is risen. You're supposed to say he is risen indeed. Now, yes, now that just as Rob said, stand up in your houses. We're going to do this again. We're going to do it the right way. So you can say it in your houses. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen. Excellent. Uh, this is Easter, uh, Easter part one, by the way. Uh, we're going to celebrate Easter again when we're all back together, whenever that is, when they lift some of the orders. We'll celebrate it together at that time. First, a couple of questions. During this season of Lent uh, or a season of coronavirus, uh, however you want to look at it, uh, Lenten coronavirus, however you want to look at it, um, how's your faith? In the middle of this, are you struggling with fear? Is your faith growing? Are you uh, finding new ways to gaze into the eyes of the Lord and think about who he is? How about your marriages? How are they doing? This is a time of great stress. I, we have, we're talking this week as staff and said that if, our, if marriages are healthy, then this time will strengthen them. If some of your marriages are not healthy, that's okay. We've said many times, don't be ashamed. Come, uh, don't come talk to us. Send us a link from the website, and uh, we can get you some help. We can talk about it with you. So I'm trusting that your marriages are actually growing through this time. That's what should happen. So we've been focusing this season of Lent on the prayers of the redeemed in Revelation. Okay. Remember at the beginning what I said was, in, John, in Revelation 4, John is given a, an open door, a portal, if you will, into heaven, that heaven and earth coincide, they exist side by side, and we actually exist within both of those spheres. That's why Paul can say we are seated at the right hand of Christ right now. We just can't see the other one. And so up until now, we have stepped through that door with John and have been looking at the songs of the redeemed, but looking at it from God's perspective. 
So what I want to do now, starting today until we get to Easter part two, is let's step back into our world and take a look at um, the songs of the redeemed from an earthly perspective. So we're going to be talking today, life without a mask. We all know what it's like to wear a mask. We'll come back to that in just a minute. So we're going to be looking at the same data, but from the earthly perspective of what happens while we're here. That way you can kind of get a glimpse of both sides of it. Okay, the background to the story in 2 Corinthians is in Exodus 34. Um, Exodus 34 has a lot of very interesting things. Some things make me laugh, but some things I get a glimpse of who the Lord is. Exodus 34 is just after the sin of the golden calf. So you may remember they had been at Mount Sinai. They're still there at Mount Sinai. And uh, they had made a covenant with the Lord. And so Moses went up to get the Ten Commandments. While he's up on the mountain getting the Ten Commandments, the people decide to build a golden calf. Uh, Aaron helps him with that, collects all the jewelry. And um, as he says later on when Moses asked him, what were you thinking? He said, well, I just put the gold jewelry in and out popped this golden calf. I love that imagery. Uh, he doesn't say, I made the golden calf. He said, I'll pop this golden calf. So when God sends uh, Moses down the mountain, uh, this is just the background to what we're about to read. He says in Exodus 32, verse 7, the Lord said to Moses, go down because your people, your people whom you brought up out of Egypt have become corrupt. I just love that. So Moses turns right around to verse 11. And it says, Lord... Why should your anger burn against your people whom you brought out of Egypt? So you got this little tug of war going. And I think uh, the Lord did that on purpose to kind of help surface with Moses. Uh, where's his true faith and what does he think about these things? So it's a wonderful interplay between God and Moses where Moses is inviting God to move closer to him and to sort out really what he thinks about these things. Then in chapter 33, Moses, the Lord said to Moses, leave this place and the people you brought out of Egypt and go up to the promised land. But he just said, I'm not going to go with you. <clears throat> think of this as a, think of it as teaching toddlers. Think of it that way. He's communicating some object lessons here in the middle of this. I'm not going to go with you. So, um, he says in verse 3 of 33, I'm not going to go with you because you're a stiff-necked people. So Moses turns around. Now we're in verse 12. Uh, Moses says, you've been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name and you have found favor with me. Verse 13, if you are pleased with me, teach me your ways so that I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Boy, isn't that a great desire of the heart? Listen to that again. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember, I love this, this nation is your people. So you've got this back and forth thing going on between God and Moses. I just love it every time I read it. So the Lord says, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Uh, in verse 17, the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing that you have asked. And what did he ask? Teach me your ways so that I may know you. I will do the very thing that you would have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. So Moses takes advantage of it. He's moving closer to the Lord now. And he says, show me your glory. Show me your glory. I have to remember... We're sitting at the base of Mount Sinai. They had not seen, this generation had not seen God's glory or seen him act. They saw the ten plagues. They did see his glory at Mount Sinai when he shook the mountain just a very short time ago before this. Moses wants to see his glory personally. Show me your glory. The Lord said, I will cause my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, Yahweh, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. But, he said, you cannot see my face. 
You cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. John chapter 1 verse 18 says, No one has ever seen God at any time. No one. So here it is. You may not see my face. So then Moses is back up on the mountain getting the Ten Commandments again because he broke the first ones. <clears throat> so I'm in chapter 34, verse 29. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the covenant law in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. So he came down from the mountain and his face is glowing. It's glowing. Excuse me one second. No, I don't have COVID-19. I'm an asthmatic. There. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant. It's glowing. They were afraid to come near him. Why were they afraid? Well, think about what's just happened in the last few days. Um, or some time period. God had scared them to death at Mount Sinai, at the very beginning, shaking the mountain, the smoke, the lightning, the blaring trumpet. And then he made this golden calf and God punished them for that. Well, yeah, they're a little nervous about this. They were afraid to come near him. Verse 31, but Moses called to them. See, here's a shepherd right here. He called to them. So Aaron and all the leaders of the community came back to him and he spoke to them. So what a shepherd does. Uh, a priest brings God to the people and brings the people to God. And this is what Moses is doing here. Afterward, all the Israelites came near to him as well. And he gave them all the commands of the Lord that the Lord had given him on Mount Sinai. When Moses finished speaking to them, he put a veil over his face. When he finished speaking, he put a veil over his face. But whenever he entered the Lord's presence to speak with him, he removed the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, they saw that his face was radiant, glowing. Then Moses put a veil back over his face until he went in to speak with the Lord. Now think about the images here of the face. It's all the way through here. His face is glowing. It's visual. It's something that you can see. This becomes very important in just a moment. So Moses desires to see God's glory, but no one can see God's face and live. And yet Moses had seen God's glory because his own face is glowing. Glowing. Okay, hold on. We all know what it's like to wear masks. It's part of our life today. I go to the post office, I go to the grocery store, and I'm passing people with masks, and I'm wearing a mask. We're not used to it, are we? It's not quite the same as a veil, but it's close enough to illustrate we know what it's like. Prior to Christ, now we're back to 2 Corinthians, we are all wearing a mask. Tim, thank you for reading this. Therefore, since we have such a hope, 2 Corinthians 3.12, we're very bold. We are not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. But their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the Old Covenant is read. It has not been removed, because only in Christ it is, is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their heart. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Prior to Christ, we all wear a mask. Only turning to Christ is the mask removed. Verse 17, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, who with unveiled faces, the mask is now taken off. We can contemplate the Lord's glory, being transformed into His image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Okay, what we're talking about here is the new covenant. 
This is what we're talking about. What we're talking about here at this second, this moment in time, is what Easter is all about. He is risen. Yeah, he is risen indeed. That's what this is talking about here. Every place we go in the Bible, we can point to Easter. He is risen, and here it is. We're talking about the new covenants. So he had just said at the beginning of chapter 3, are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Now, this is language that they would have understood, very common in the first century. Or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you? No, we don't. Why? He said, you yourselves are our letter. You are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry. You're the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. You know, in both Ezekiel and Jeremiah, they talk about the new covenant. And uh, it says, when the new covenant, when the Spirit comes, He's going to replace the heart of stone with the heart of flesh and write His law upon our hearts. That's us today. That's why Paul can say, you yourselves are our letter. It's great. It's a great picture. We are ministers of the new covenant. He goes on in verse 6. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Now, part of the Exodus uh, story, Exodus 34, part of the issue there was perceiving God's glory. You see the problem, as I mentioned, John 1.18 says, no one has ever seen God. Even Moses was not allowed to see God's face. This is the background to this story. So, starting in verse 7. Now, if the ministry that brought death, they all died. They died in the desert and uh, the law did bring death. Paul argues that or, uh, in Romans. If the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses. Here's that face imagery again. Because of its glory, transitory though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? When the new covenant comes and the ministry comes, the Old Testament law was fantastic. It was great. I've said many times, I know most of you have never read the law, but if you actually read it, it's not confusing, it's not complex, it's not hard. Read any law and you could obey it. That wasn't the issue. This was the issue right here. This was the issue. So if that law was glorious which the Bible repeatedly says it was, then when the ministry comes under the new covenant, isn't it going to be far better? Isn't it going to be the greatest thing to be far better? If the ministry, verse 9, that brought condemnation was glorious, and it was, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? That's the new covenant. That's the new covenant. For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was transitory came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? The new covenant is fantastic. And yet in this passage, we are not allowed to see God's glory um, until the mask is removed. Verse 18. And we all with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory. The mask has to be taken away for us to see the glory of the Lord. We are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So why can some see it and others cannot? Why? The difference is faith. That's what makes the difference. It's faith. How can this be? How can it be? What's happening here? You see, the glory of God <clears throat> is revealed in Jesus. That's why. His glory is revealed in Jesus. John 1.18 No one has seen God at any time, but the only begotten Son, who is himself God, reveals him. That's why Jesus could say to Philip, Have you been with me all this time? And you don't get it? He who has seen me has seen the Father. 
And so the Son, Jesus, reveals God, the Father. He is the one who reveals God's glory. If you go on in chapter 4, there's two very important verses here. One is in verse 4. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. So Israel becomes, if you will, a type, and now he's moved beyond that to all those that reject Messiah. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. The world cannot see this glory, and therefore they cannot see Christ. He doesn't make sense to them. That's why I've said, don't be afraid to tell people you're a Christian. They don't really know who Jesus is. They don't understand. Now, they understand religiosity. And whatever their background is, when it comes to the faith, that usually directs how they respond. But it's not because they, don't, they know Jesus or not. It takes faith. But then he goes on in verse 6 and adds another piece to it. Uh, I'm sorry, verse 11. Uh, no, no, verse 6. Um, For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. There it is. Christ reveals the glory of the Father. You see, the glory left the temple. We have that in Ezekiel. When the people disobeyed and God exiled them. And now the glory has come back. And we see that glory now in the face of Christ. Um, as someone turns to Jesus, they are able, they are enabled to see that glory. But how? We can't see Jesus right now. How can you see his glory? And this is where it gets very interesting. I'm going to give you three different ways. One is communion. In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 14, Paul says, Therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. He goes on in verse 16, Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in Christ? Isn't that a participation? And is not the bread that we break, isn't that a participation as well in the body, the blood and body of Christ? That's why we say the body of Christ given for you, the blood of Christ shed for you, and we do this every week. I long to be together again so we can do it. So this is one of those places where God's, the glory of Jesus is revealed to us. But another one is right here in the passage, and it's through our ministries. In 1 Corinthians 4, verse 11. We who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake. Why? Why? Why are we being given over to death? So that his life may also, the life of Jesus, may be revealed in our mortal bodies. So, we have the privilege of experiencing and gazing into the face of Jesus. The world does not. This is how it's revealed. Through the way we, we celebrate our belief in communion and the way we celebrate our ministries. I would argue also that based on James 1, it comes through intently looking, gazing into the Word of God. Right there. If you've never had a time... To gaze. Now's the time to do it. You see, we see what the world cannot see. We see what the world cannot see, but we have to look closely. The world can see it if they look at us. So what happens when we see this glory? Now we're back to 1 Corinthians 3 and a controversial little word here, which is fabulous. I think John did, I mean, uh, I think Paul did something incredible here. And we all, us, with unveiled faces, the mask is now taken away, contemplate the Lord's glory. And if you have the NIV, you'll notice a footnote that says it reflects. We're being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. And so there's discussion is it, is it contemplating or is it reflecting? And I'm going to argue that, that the word was deliberate and it does both. We contemplate as well as reveal the glory of the Lord 
through the things that we do. The deeper we look, the deeper we gaze, the deeper we scan, the more we are transformed into his image. And what does this mean? What does it mean to be transformed into his image? That means we become more like him. That's what it means. We become a better human. As we gaze into the eyes of the Lord, of Jesus, and as we meditate on who he is, and as we model it in our relationships, we become better humans. We begin to love each other better, more deeply. We become more generous. We become more affectionate so we can do like Moses of those who are afraid. Come, just come. Come closer. Come closer. Rob and I were talking this week about uh, we have similar pasts and how many people we know, hundreds and hundreds, who because, not because they understand Jesus, but because of religiosity, want nothing to do with the church. We have this great privilege of saying, why don't you tell me your story? Because I don't want to be like that. I don't want to be like that person that drove you away, whatever it was. I want to be like Moses that says, don't be afraid, come. Come closer. Come closer to me. I know that when they come closer to me, they're going to experience more of Jesus. That's what I know. If I treat them well. And this is what moving, transforming into his image is all about. We become stronger and stronger magnets. John Calvin used the imagery of a mirror. He said that the mirror, when we turn to Christ, is kind of dirty. still reflects his glory, but it's dirty. And as we transform into his image, it's like polishing the mirror. We become better humans. We love people more. We give faster. We run to their aid quicker. We invite them closer. We love them more deeply. We're generous with them. All the ways that you can think of that you might have been hurt. We have the privilege of overcoming that. And that's what's happening here. We both contemplate as in a mirror and we reflect like a mirror. They happen at the same time. As we gaze more deeply, we reflect more brightly. Maybe another way to say it. The deeper we look, the more we reveal to those around us what they cannot otherwise see. Their vision right now for many of them is limited to religiosity, to church structure, polity, politics, programming, hypocrisy, all the things that we know about. That's what their vision is limited to. The only way for them to begin to see the glory of Christ is to invite them, invite them to the inside, into the relationship, like Moses did. We begin to shine brighter and brighter as we are transformed into his image. We become mirrors of the one true living God. And I love this imagery in verse 7. This is the treasure I think he's talking about in the jars of clay in verse 7 of chapter 4. We have this treasure in jars of clay. We're still human and we're still broken. I've said in other sermons that when somebody accuses us of being hypocrites, we should jump up and down and say, you're right, because that gives us the opportunity to tell the truth. You're right. I don't want to be a hypocrite. Tell me what you see. Tell me what you see. If all we do is is exudes some level of perfection. The world knows it's fake. They know it's fake. And he says right here, we have this treasure in jars of clay. We're still human that carry this treasure around to show that this all-surpassing power is not from us. It says it's from God. He's the one that makes it happen. He's the one that reveals it. Okay, what does this mean? I'm going to read you a quote. It's a little bit of a lengthy quote. From A.W. Tozer, when I became a Christian many, many years ago, I was invited to read this, and I've, I've read all of his books that I, that I could get my hands on at least three times. The language is a little bit old. I think it's 1948, 49 time frame. But listen to these words. <clears throat> Faith is the gaze of a soul upon a saving God. And just think about that. That's the opening word. Faith is the gaze of a soul upon a saving God. For all my Christian life, I've had this image of gazing into the eyes of the Lord. That's why I use that imagery when I'm talking to people across the uh, table having coffee. 
If they could look in my eyes, they would see them dancing with delight. They would see a gaze. When somebody admits to me sin, I realize I'm experiencing one of the great miracles of all time because the Holy Spirit's done something wonderful. And if they looked in my eyes, they'd see that joy. And that's what he's talking about here. When, we had, when he had seen this and he could remember passages he had read before, we jumped into a story, their meaning would come flooding over him. Psalm 34, 5, they looked into him, they looked unto him and were lightened and their faces were not ashamed. Or Psalm 123, unto thee lift I up mine eyes, O thou that dwellest in the heavens. Behold, as the eyes of servants look unto the hand of their masters and the eyes of a maiden unto the hand of her mistress, so our eyes wait upon the Lord our God until that he have mercy upon us. Here the man seeking mercy looks straight at the God of mercy and never takes his eyes away from him till he grants mercy. And our Lord himself looked always at God. Looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke and gave the bread to his disciples, Matthew 14. Indeed, Jesus taught that he wrought his works by always keeping his inward eyes upon his Father. His power lay in his continuous look at God. In full accord with the few texts that we have quoted is the whole tenor of the inspired word. It is summed up for us in the Hebrew epistle when, he, when we are instructed to run life's race looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, Hebrews 12. From all this we learn that faith is not a once done act, but a continuous gaze of the heart at the triune God. This is a perfect time being quarantined or stuck in your houses to gaze to the eyes of God. Believing then is directing the heart's attention to Jesus. It is lifting the mind to quote, behold the Lamb of God, which is Easter. And never ceasing that beholding for the rest of our lives. At first this may be difficult but it becomes easier as we look steadily at his wondrous person, quietly and without strain. Distractions may hinder, but once the heart is committed to him, after each brief excursion away from him, the attention will return and rest upon him like a wandering bird coming back to his window. Gaze deeply. That's what he's arguing. And you become like Moses. Come. Come closer. Because our mask has been taken away and we can gaze into the eyes of the Lord and then our friends can see the glory of Jesus by looking at us, just like Moses reflected the glory of the Lord. Oh, I'm not sure our faces glow like that, but they see it in the way we minister and love people. That's what he's talking about. That's why he said to the Corinthians, you are letters written by the Holy Spirit. That's what it means. This is our purpose, and this is what it means to gaze deeply. We're going to look for the next several weeks on what does it mean to take the mask away in church, in our marriages, and things like that. And when we get to Easter, we will have looked at the heavenly side, we will have looked at the earthly side, and we can say together as a people of God, He is risen. That's what Easter is all about. Father, thank you. Thank you for being so kind and so good. Thank you for um, being who you are. Thank you for not turning away from us, just the opposite, moving closer to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week we did a drive through communion. Today, Easter, we're going to do a flow-through communion. We're going to invite you to come. We're going to limit you to 10 at a time here in the sanctuary uh, in keeping with the health order. So there's only one door that's going to be open, the door by the kitchen. Uh, I'll be there to make sure that you you can't get in any other door. It's the only one. Come in, and if you want, you can come this way, and you can sit, maintain social distancing. And when you're finished, there'll be words on the screen about the Easter story, music playing, and you can take 30 minutes, and you can reflect on the Lord And then you can go out this door and there'll be communion over here. If you'd like to just come take communion, we're doing it this way because of the weather. 
If you'd like to just come take communion, you can walk in the door and walk straight down the narthex and down by the offices is another communion and you can go out that door. So at no point are we crossing each other. It's flow through like drive through. So we invite you to come between 1130 and 4 today to do either one or both of those. Thank you. Enjoy the peace of Christ.